and welcome back for chapter four of our floor series. When we left off on the last video, we had just been introduced to Leo and the door boy or the bellboy Remy. Um, it's Pilar's son who is the maid at the hotel and Leo is the son of the maintenance man Clarence. Uh, he lives there on location with his father in the basement and it kind of gave us a little lowdown on how the hotel is organized and how the Fillmores live in the basement and they're the maintenance men who take care of everything around there and the owner of the Whippet Hotel, Mer Ganser D. Whippet, has disappeared for a hundred days and counting and strange things are starting to happen and Leo is wondering where he is and suddenly he is presented with a mysterious box um, that gives him some very interesting clues uh, to a challenge that he must face, hopefully uh, with a duck and with another child, uh, to save the Whippet, and that's all he knows. Uh, so we are now launching into the fun part of the Floors series. So here we go with Chapter 4, Into the Pinball Machine. It was a beautiful summer night on the grounds where Mr. Phipps had surrounded the carved hedges and giant bushes around the pond with tiny lights that shone like stars. The ducks had been brought down and swam lazily in the water, quacking softly at the setting sun, although Betty was not among them. Dinner is served, said Miss Sparks, playing hostess to the guests who'd chosen to attend the party. This included a smattering of short stays, including Jane Yancey, the ornery little daughter of the zillionaire, and her mother, Nancy Yancey. The father, presumably, had business to attend to on Wall Street. Miss Pompadour was there with Heine, who sat by the pond barking at the ducks. Meanwhile, Captain Rickenbacker was deep in conversation with Mr. Phipps about the shapes of the bushes. I want a duck said little Jane Yancey, who wouldn't leave the edge of the pond to come to the table. Ask your father, said her mother. Do you want to cook the duck or put it on a leash? asked Miss Pompadour, who had no patience whatsoever for spoiled children. Jane ran to the table and sat by her mother, complaining about the rude woman and her barking dog, and dinner was served. There was no main kitchen in the hotel, but it didn't matter. Dinner, along with every other meal at the Whippet, was catered by one of the finest restaurants in New York, one block off the property. The restaurant was owned by the Whippet Estate, and it only served the hotel. If you had a yellow or a green key card, you could dine there any time of the day or night and never pay a dime. Tips were also discouraged. Or guests could ring the restaurant by inserting a key card into a dining slot in their rooms and food would be delivered to their doors under silver domes on piping hot plates. The staff was not invited to dine with the guests unless you were Ms. Sparks. And so it was that Leo had eaten dinner in the basement, a bowl of ramen noodles and a banana, while he'd stared into the purple box. His father was off in the expanse of the maintenance tunnels working on something or other when Leo made the call. Remy, are you there? A split second later, Remy answered like he'd been holding the two-way radio next to his face waiting for it to go off. I'm here. Where are you? Oh, that's not important now. Who's in the lobby? Me and my mom. Your dad came through on his way up a while ago, but otherwise it's been quiet. Do you know where Captain Rickenbacker is? I do. He's at the dinner party by the pond on the grounds. Good. He went as I'd hoped. There was a leather string tied to his belt notch, and Leo pulled it out, staring at a tiny watch that was attached to the end. Betty was busy gobbling up half of Leo's dinner while he talked, a stray noodle hanging from her bill. I've got Betty with me, and I'll need to return her and the rest of the ducks to the roof in just under an hour. In the meantime, I've got an errand to run. Call me if Captain Rickenbacker comes back, will you? Sure I will. Remy had let himself grow too enthusiastic, and his mother looked up from behind the desk where she was filing her nails. You must be hungry, no? she asked. She smiled and Remy called and called Remy to the desk where she gave him a cold tamale wrapped in wax paper. You make me proud, my little doorman. Keep working hard and you'll make your way in the world. Remy went back to the door with one hand in his pocket, secretly holding the two-way radio in case Leo needed him. 
In his other hand, he held his dinner, which was a repeat of what he'd had for lunch. Hearing the distant sound of ducks quacking on the pond, he gazed out over the grounds and wondered what Leo and Betty were doing. There were two ways into Captain Rickenbacker's room on the third floor, one in the hallway and one in the maintenance tunnel. Not all the rooms were designed this way, but there had been some problems over the past two years in that room, so Mr. Whippet had shown Leo a secret way in. Captain Rickenbacker had a habit of pushing large pieces of furniture in front of the door and refusing to come out, which was usually because his arch nemesis, Mr. M, had entered the hotel. Mr. M was, as far as the hotel staff could tell, a figment of Captain Rickenbacker's imagination. It was usually Leo's dad who was sent in to reassure the captain and move the furniture away from the door so that Pilar could clean the room. Leo looked down at Betty. You be careful in here, okay? It's really no place for a duck. Betty didn't seem to be paying attention as Leo spun the combination lock on the secret door from the maintenance tunnel. On the room side, it looked as if part of the wall were swinging open, and when the door was closed again, it would look like there was no door at all. Betty waddled through the opening, and Leo, holding the purple box under one arm, followed her. He was careful not to let the door shut all the way, marveling at one of the most dangerous rooms in the hotel. It looks like fun, but really, it's a duck killer. Be super careful, Betty. She honked, nodded her head, and waddled forward. Captain Rickenbacker stayed in a large and colorful room known as the pinball machine. The pinball machine had windows high up on the walls, from which the setting sun cast a golden glow over all the parts and pieces. I always liked this room, said Leo. He was tempted to set the purple box down and play one of the 23 pinball machines that lined the bedroom wall, but he knew his time was limited. It would require some luck getting into the ring of rooms as it was, so there was no time for goofing off. The last thing he needed was for Captain Rickenbacker to return, thinking this little kid in his room was a manifestation of his made-up arch enemy, Mr. M. If that happened... Captain Rickenbacker might go bananas and start throwing things. And there were some dangerous, heavy things to throw in the pinball machine. Leo walked into the main room, which was long and narrow, in the same way that a pinball machine was. This was the centerpiece of the pinball machine, with giant molded pinball bumpers that doubled as couches and chairs, all of them lit up with bright lights and springs. The slanted floor was covered in lights and arrows and circled numbers, just like a real pinball machine. At the far end of the room was a hole as big as a tire, which had a flipper on each side. Behind that was the doorway that led to the third floor landing. Betty waddled down the room and honked into the hole, listening to the echo as Leo looked around. While he'd eaten dinner next to the glugging boiler in the basement, he'd reread Merganser's message, searching for clues. Floor and three and one half. This, he was sure, meant to say there were hidden rooms in the hotel, and one of them was above the third floor and below the fourth. He was now standing in the pinball machine, which was on the third floor, staring up at the ceiling and wondering what was up there. Strike the purple ball in the kitchen by the hall. Leo walked down the slick, slanted floor, careful not to slip, and arrived at the control booth. He set the box down and found himself feeling happy about the fact that the purple ball was stuck under a blue ball. They were big, like bowling balls, and just about as heavy. The blue ball would have to be played in order to retrieve the purple one from the track. In fact, the purple ball would need to be played as well because the balls were stuck under a sheet of thick plexiglass. They were only dangerous after they were shot into play. After that, a person could really get hurt in the pinball machine, which was definitely why Ms. Sparks was so happy Captain Rickenbacker had stayed in the room so long. No one else would rent it. Betty, said Leo, we'll need to play a couple of balls. Stay in here with me, okay? Betty didn't mind being picked up. In fact, she loved it. When Leo put one hand on each side and lifted her up so she could stand near the controls, she sighed happily. 
Leo pulled back on the giant spring-loaded ball whacker and let go, sending the blue ball up the silver rails and into play. It bounced off spring-loaded couches and chairs, spun through a whirly gig, and headed for one of the two giant flippers. The room was alive with bells and zingers, lights blinking everywhere. Betty was mesmerized, concentrating on every move the ball made. Leo had planned to simply let the ball bounce off the flipper and land in the gutter, but he couldn't help himself. He simply had to slap the flipper buttons with the palms of his hand. The buttons were big, like dinner plates and send the blue ball sailing back up toward the kitchen where it knocked down several letters that spelled out Merganser. The back wall spun the score on white tiles with black numbers as the ball came flying back toward the control booth. It slammed into a bumper and took flight, crashing into thick plexiglass in front of Leo's face. Leo naff, laughed nervously, thinking to himself, <laughs> if uh, not for the plexiglass, that ball would have knocked my block off. Betty honked nervously, flapping her wings in the small space. Just stay put, you'll be fine. He let the blue ball drop into the tire size hole, then he shot the purple ball into play. This was where it would get dangerous, because he needed that ball. He'd have to go out and get it. Okay, Leo, you can do this. Just take it slow. You wait here he told Betty, giving her a stern look that she returned with equal vigor. Betty didn't like to be bossed. The ball was bouncing wildly back and forth between two chairs as Leo jumped out from behind the safety of the control room. He was standing in the middle of a live pinball machine, wondering what it would feel like to catch a bowling ball going 50 miles an hour. The ball came free from the back and forth of the bump bumpers and down the floor at lightning speed. Leo dove out of the way, sliding into a bumper of his own and feeling it fling him back like a rag doll. As he got his bearings, Leo saw that the ball had bounced back up in an arc. He turned and jumped, catching the ball in the gut as it knocked him to the slippery floor. The weight of the ball pulled Leo down toward a round hole that would try to swallow him up, but Leo was a fast thinker, even inside a giant pinball machine. He held the ball in his arms, spread his legs, and caught hold of one flipper with each foot. If Betty were to walk onto one of the flipper buttons in the control booth, he might not live to tell about it. And he watched the duck carefully. Betty quacked. She stared at Leo, then at the big white buttons. Betty, no, please, don't. She held one webbed foot over the right flipper button, paused, then slammed it down. Leo leaned over to the left flipper just in time, but Betty was laughing now, waddling back and forth between the flippers as if it were the most fun she had ever had in her life. It took four or five jumps back and forth before Leo dove past the gutter and landed against the door with a thud. That wasn't nice, he chided the duck, standing up with the bowling ball in his arms. His secret two-way radio squawked to life. Remy here. Leo, you there? Remy was whispering. Not a good sign. Leo pulled out the tiny watch on the string. Oh, 20 minutes gone already. I'm here. What's up? Nothing much. I'm bored. What are you doing? Leo thought about what he should say. Remy was still brand new and he barely knew him. What if he told him a crazy duck was trying to kill him inside a giant pinball machine? So he settled for something slightly less weird. I can't talk now. I'm dodging bowling balls. Don't don't call unless Rickenbacker's coming up here. Got it? Do you have any idea how lame it is standing at the door? You're dodging bowling balls and my brain cells are melting from boredom. You gotta get me in the game. Not now, Remy. Stay focused. We'll talk about this later. Leo put his plan into high gear, setting Betty on the pinball floor and running up to the kitchen with the purple ball under one arm and the box under the other. He could barely hold on to both and nearly drop the ball twice, which would have meant playing the whole thing out again and probably getting flipped around the room by an unreliable duck. He got to the kitchen and saw the spot he was looking for, a wall of lights in the shapes of bowling balls. One of them was purple and Leo felt sure he knew what to do. Strike the purple ball in the kitchen by the hall. Three times fast. Duck! 
He set the box down on the counter, careful not to let it touch a bumper. Then he held the heavy purple ball in front of the round light and shoved. When the ball hit the light, it kept right on going, right through the wall and dropped out of sight. Then the ball was back. Uh Uh-oh, said Leo. I I I don't think that was supposed to happen. Betty quacked from the floor and Leo looked down. The ball was back, rolling out of a different hole by his feet. I guess I should do it three times, right? He asked Betty. Betty just stared at the refrigerator, which was shaped like a huge flipper standing on end. When Leo picked up the ball, it was half as heavy. Different ball. Interesting. He shoved it at the light again, and again it melted into the wall, dropped out of sight, and appeared at his feet. This time it was a lot lighter, like an oversized golf ball. Is it just me, or is this getting more confusing by the minute? The one-way conversation with Betty was surprisingly calming, and Leo began to think he was more like Merganser than he even... ah, And Leo began to think maybe he was more like Merganser than he'd even thought. Merganser loved talking, but didn't and want anyone talking back. Leo was like that too. Speaking helped him think clearly and ducks were awfully good listeners. One more time and I bet this thing will float away. Leo passed the ball through the hole one last time and when he did, Betty honked louder than Leo had ever heard her honk before. He was reminded in that split second of one very important word in Merganser's note. Duck! In this particular case, his mind flashed a message. Merganser probably wasn't talking about a real duck. He probably meant you're supposed to duck. Not one to take chances, Leo ducked. And when he did, the original purple ball, the one that felt like a bowling ball, flew out of the hole in the wall and back into the pinball machine where it belonged. It careened through a flipping turnstile near the ceiling, an impossible shot from any other angle, and all the lights in the room went dark. The ball bounced loudly into the gutter, and when it was gone, the lights came up a dark purple. A deep hum filled the room as a hole slid open in the ceiling, and a white light shone down on the dark surface of the floor. A ladder descended. Leo had popped back up when the ball flew past his head and had watched the pinball machine change. Now he was back on the floor, crouching down as another purple ball rolled out and bumped lazily against his foot. Leo took a moment to thank Betty for saving his life, then picked up the fourth ball. It felt like a ping pong ball. Leo dropped it and it bounced right back up with a hollow sound. Leo thought of the other words Merganser had written on the box. And bring the ball. You'll need it. All right, I will, said Leo. He started walking toward the ladder, worried and nervous as Remy's voice blasted out of the two-way radio. Captain Rickenbacker's on the move. He's headed your way. Leo had turned the room a deep shade of neon purple and opened a hole in the ceiling in the space of half an hour. He had no idea how to make everything go back the way it was. So he did what any kid would do. He threw the ball and the duck up into the hole, grabbed the purple box, and climbed up the ladder. Chapter 5. The Room of Rings or the Ring of Rooms When Captain Rickenbacker placed his yellow key card into the slot for his room, he heard an unexpected sequence of sounds. A swoosh, a slam, and a charge of electric energy. He jumped back from the door as if it were covered in kryptonite. He considered himself distantly related to Superman. Mr. M, I presume, he whispered, for he was sure his enemy was inside, rigging all sorts of traps in his beloved pinball machine. If Captain Rickenbacker could have seen what was happening on the other side of the door, it would have almost surely confirmed his suspicions. The latter shot back from where it had come with stunning speed. The round door in the ceiling slammed shut. The lights in the pinball machine went back to the way they had been before. 
the captain's key card had activated a fail safe to the ring of rooms. Stealth was not one of Captain Rickenbacker's strong suits. He was more inclined to bold attacks and ninja moves. And so it was that he burst open the door and started shooting bowling balls into the room, one right after the yellow, other yelling all the while, take that and that and that. Leo was alone on floor three and one half in an airtight room. There was no noise from above, no noise from below. Both the secret, secret two-way radio and his walkie-talkie had lost their signals. He could not hear Captain Rickenbacker trying with all his superhero might to flush out Mr. M. The only noise Leo could hear was Betty's soft breathing, which was very soft indeed. I think it's time I open the box again, Leo said. Betty didn't quack, but she seemed to approve of the idea, and Leo slid the cover off, staring inside. Over dinner, he had figured out that the lid would slide onto the back of the box as well, and this he did so as not to leave it behind if he got lost in the maze. I think I'm standing right here, he said, setting the box and the very large purple ping pong ball on the floor next to him. He was pointing to a small round mark on the floor while Betty waddled off behind him. The box was full of colored rings of different sizes, and so was the room. All the walls in the real room were bright white, lit from behind frosty glass. And all the rings were positioned exactly where they were in the box. The advantage to having the box, it seemed to Leo, was that he knew how to navigate the complex maze before him. But he quacked from farther away than Leo was comfortable with. She was a mischievous companion, known to wander off on her own, and he felt sure she was about to somehow open the door and send the ladder back into the room below. But when he looked over his shoulder, he saw that she was simply staring at a white wall of frosty glass, where a message had started to appear. Leo took three steps toward her through the only ringless space in the whole maze and watched as the words appeared. It was as if someone were behind the glass, writing on a foggy window with his finger. Did you bring the ball? Make it fly. Make it fall. Mr. M. Something fell out of the ceiling, missing Betty by a hair, and a dark shadow moved behind the glass. Leo jumped back, afraid of something in the Whippet Hotel for the first time in his life. He wasn't alone in the ring of rooms, as he'd supposed. And what was more frightening still, Mr. M wasn't a figment of someone's imagination. He was real. Maybe Captain Rickenbacker wasn't totally off his rocker after all. Leo gathered his nerves and picked up what had, been, what had fallen out of the ceiling. It looked like it had been designed to work with the box. It had a metal platform and two handles sticking out like the handles of a motorcycle. He took up the box and placed it carefully on top of the square platform between the handles. A perfect fit, if there ever was one. A new sound rose from behind him, the sound of wind. When Leo turned, the giant ping pong ball had floated up into the air. Oh, I know what I'm supposed to do, he said excitedly. I understand. He told Betty to stay right behind him and to do exactly as he did, and somehow he knew she'd understand. She fell in line as Leo held the handles on the box and stared into the model. I know the way out of here, but there must be some trick to it, and the trick must invo involve the ball. As he neared the floating ball, he felt what he'd expected. A strong channel of air was coming out of the floor holding up the ball. Leo twisted the right handle as if he were actually riding a motorcycle and watched as the ball moved slowly forward. Twisting it the other way brought the ball right back. He tilted the front edge of the box down and the ball descended, the flow of air from the floor growing weaker. Then he tilted the front of the ball up faster than he should have and the ball bounced off the ceiling. He leveled the box and the ball was back, holding steady in front of his eyes. <sighs> Well, Betty, I know how to get this ball through the maze. I just don't know why I'm doing it. Leo shrugged. There was nothing to be done but guide the ball and follow it through, and so he began. 
Everything started out fine, twisting and turning through one green, then one yellow, then two red rings, Betty hopping through the rings behind him. But then he came to a place in the round maze where there were two rings to choose from. They were in the opening that would send him deeper into the maze, closer to the middle and the very end. Would it matter which one he chose? He thought not, and he sent the ball through the blue ring on the right. When he did, the ring filled with spires of electricity and the ball exploded into dust. Leo lurched back, nearly falling into one of the rings, and stared in shock at the purple dust particles flying everywhere. If there were such a thing as fairy dust, Leo thought, it would look like this. The electric charge had turned the ball into sparkling purple mist that stuck in Leo's round tuft of hair and danced on the wind. He tried to calm himself down, but could only imagine what would happen to him if he went through the wrong ring. Would he, too, be turned to dust, never to escape the ring of rooms or the room of rings? Well, at least now I know what the purple ball was for, he said, but it's gone now. Leo was aware of the time ticking away, and this only added to his anxiety. Checking his watch, he saw that he'd already been gone a full hour. Miss Sparks would be furious about the ducks being left in the pond. Then she'd find that Betty was missing and go ballistic. And what about his father? What would he say if Leo couldn't be found? Leo was looking at Betty like she might have the answer to all his problems, but it turned out she had the key to a different question. She was staring at one of the frosty glass walls again, watching a new message appear. Leo joined her as an unseen finger wrote out seven words before the shadow moved off again. Turn the handle back three times fast. Leo was beside himself with worry, but he couldn't give up now. For starters, he didn't know how to get the round door back open again. And even if he could get it open, there would be Captain Rickenbacker and his flying bowling balls to deal with. He turned the handle one, back once, a second time, then once more. A blue ball, round and perfect, dropped out of the ceiling and was held on the wind in front of the two rings. Huh. I wonder how many of these I get, Leo said to Betty, excited to have another ball, but realizing he had to be extremely careful. If he got too far into the maze and ran out of balls, he might never get out. He'd have to remember exactly which rings were capable of turning him into fairy dust. Leo twisted the handle forward and sent the blue ball safely through the opening on the left, then stepped through himself. Betty carefully flew through the ring as well, and they were safely into the second circular layer of the maze. Looking at the model in the box, Leo saw many openings that led to the next inner level, but only one had an arrow pointing inside. He was excited again, less nervous, realizing that no one else but he could complete the maze and <laughs> live to tell about it. During the next 20 minutes, Leo blew up four more giant ping pong balls on his way to the center of the Room of Rings. He began to anticipate seeing them explode and felt less anxious when they did. Watching the orange ball blast into dust was particularly enjoyable because orange was his favorite color. He couldn't have known, for there were no mirrors in the maze, but his hair was starting to look like a rainbow, dusted with purple, green, orange, yellow, and blue as he arrived in the inner circle of the maze. He'd exploded the green ball on the way into this chamber, and passing through the opening into the center of the maze, he felt as if he were standing in the middle of an igloo. The walls were frosty white and perfectly round, curved into a dome at the top. He stood there with his box and his duck and wondered what he should do, for the room was completely empty. The opening to the room, which he had just passed through, was suddenly gone, filled by a curved wall sliding down from above. Leo was trapped in a half circle of pure white, his heart beating faster as a terrible thought crossed his mind. No one knows I'm here. But that wasn't entirely true. There was one person who knew, and whoever it was began writing a message on the ceiling, just like he'd written the other messages before. Is that you, Merganzer? 
asked Leo, setting the purple box and the handles on the floor and reaching up toward the ceiling. Won't you please come out? He'd had his suspicions, but there was no way he could know for sure. It was a dangerous path he'd taken to the white room, and it would be unlike his old friend to place him in harm's way. Then again, who else could it be helping him along and pretending to be Mr. M all this time? It was a short message, only three words. Take the ring. At first, the message made no sense because there were no rings in the room to take. But then something small dropped through a hole in the ceiling. Quickly thrusting out his hand, Leo caught the object before it hit the floor. There was a deep silence then. Even Betty seemed to understand that something important had just happened. Leo knew it too, but he didn't say anything. There was something very special about the ring that had fallen into his hand. Something so special it nearly made him cry, but not quite as he placed it in his pocket next to his mother's watch. Thank you, whoever you are. Without any warning at all, the hole in the ceiling got bigger and a blue box fell through. It was the exact same shape and size as the purple box sitting in the center of the room. Leo caught the blue box as it was falling, finding it heavier than the purple box, but not by much. On the lid was a message. Don't turn me upside down. Don't open me until morning. The emblem of Merganser's head was also on the box, right in the middle. I got another box, said Leo, very proud of himself for what he'd done. What do you think of that, Betty? Betty was growing very bored and extremely hungry. She honked irritably, staring up at Leo as if to say, I've had it with rings and rooms and boxes. Get me to the roof or I will chew on your shoes. We have been in here a while, haven't we? But I don't know how to get out. Leo wanted desperately to open the blue box, but he'd been told not to, so instead he took the purple box off the handles and set them aside. He put the lid back on the purple box and set the boxes next to each other. And then he sat there for a minute, unsure what to do, until a new message appeared on the ceiling. Connect the boxes. Pick them up. Like all the earlier messages, this one appeared, then slowly drifted away, the frost returning to the glass. It took only a moment for Leo to figure out that the blue box slid snugly on top of the purple box on little wooden rails he hadn't paid any mind to before. The two were one now, inseparable unless they were intentionally slid apart. There was one last message being drawn with a finger on the glass, and this one worried Leo greatly. Hold on tight! He didn't see any reason to hold on tight, so the message unnerved him. Should he hold the boxes tight or pick up Betty and hold her tight? Or was the floor about to fall? The third thing Leo thought, the thought about the floor falling away, was the reason he was supposed to hold on tight. He found himself on a twisting slide and wondered if he was inside one of the tubes of the double helix. Oh, those were far too narrow, he knew. But things had gotten so terribly strange at the Whippet Hotel that he couldn't tell up from down. Wherever he was, he was falling fast, turning sharply every few seconds, barely keeping hold of the two boxes that had become one. He came to a harrowing U-turn and was tossed from the tube, landing squarely on top of the duck elevator. He made the mistake of turning toward the echoing sound of Betty sliding down behind him, and she crashed into his face, feathers flying as she regained her webbed footing and quacked angrily. Leo threw open the trap door atop the duck elevator and jumped inside, landing with a bouncy thud. He grabbed the boxes first, then the duck, and shut himself inside. Ugh, it's getting awfully crowded in here, wouldn't you say? He asked Betty. Two boxes, a boy, and a duck did take up some space when there wasn't much to be had. There was plenty of good news, though, as the small elevator lurched to life and started its slow descent to the lobby. Leo was in possession of the second of four boxes. He was halfway to somewhere, though he had no idea where. He had a special ring in his pocket. And he was free of the room of rings or the ring of rooms, whichever it was called. 
The bad news? The walkie-talkie had started working again, and Ms. Sparks was screaming at him. Bernard Frescobaldi was back in the hotel across the street, staring at the huge, nearly empty block that held the Whippet Hotel. Something was troubling him. Milton, a cappuccino, if you please. Right away, sir, right away. Milton went to work at the rather elaborate coffee-making machine in the corner of the room. It had been brought over from Italy, along with Italian espresso beans, cups, saucers, spoons, and a grinder. The room filled with the smells and sounds of good, strong coffee. Something's not right over there, said Bernard as Milton delivered the small red cup topped with foam. How do you mean, sir? Milton returned to the machine to make his own drink, for he knew his boss would take some time answering the question. Someone is set against us, though I can't see who, Bernard continued, still staring out the window as Milton returned. I think our plan is going to work, Milton assured him, sipping carefully from his own cup. How can we lose with you-know-who on the job? True enough. Still. I can't help but want to stack the deck more in my favor. Read me that travel entry, will you? Again, Milton, I think it may be of some help. Milton went to his silver briefcase, rifled through the contents, and found the entry in question. He sipped his strong coffee, cleared his throat, and began reading out loud. Merganser D. Whippet, Travelogue 3. I am traveling with George once more on the train between New York and Washington, D.C. George keeps telling me how much money I've gotten hold of and how hard it will be to spend it all. I keep reminding him I have plans equal to the task. I've only ridden two train systems, the one that leads to the boarding school in Pittsburgh and the one I'm on now. I adore one train, loathe the other, a true love-hate relationship. No travel was ever so dreary as the train ride to and from the boarding school. But the second train, the one I'm riding now, was mine and my mother's for a brief time. She'd been tired a lot for some reason, so I said we didn't have to go, but she insisted. Being five, I was all too happy to agree. We should go. We took the train to the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., and she pointed out all sorts of things along the way, which surprised me. When had she ever been out and about? I'd always imagined her folding my clothes and making my breakfast. Funny how I didn't realize how remarkable she was, how much she'd accomplished. Dad had said of D.C., take him to the Mint to watch the make money. It might teach him a thing or two. But my mother had other ideas. She liked rockets, history, art, music, and especially robots. Or could it be she knew I loved those things best and wanted me to see them? Either way, we never went back. One time on the better train of the two was all I ever got. After that, my mother was tired all the time. She hardly got out of bed. And I thought a terrible thought. Our one great adventure had worn her out. I'd exhausted her. MDW. P.S. I have plans for a hotel, and the hotel will be a railroad room. I don't think I'll let anyone inside the railroad room. At least not for a while. Bernard shook his head. Milton scrunched his nose. I've been all through the place, top to bottom. There is no railroad room, right? Either way, our plan is in motion. Things will get interesting starting tomorrow. Milton sipped the last of his coffee. I can hardly wait. Chapter 6. Theodore Bump and the Troublesome Robot By the time Leo reached the lobby, the hotel was ready for the night. Remy had fallen asleep in one of the big chairs while his mother quietly dusted the brass handrails. Ms. Sparks was nowhere to be seen, off on a rampage searching for Leo all over the hotel. Leo tucked the two boxes beneath the nearest sculpted green bush, it was in the shape of a rabbit, and turned to send the duck elevator back up to the roof. Betty was sitting down in it, nestled in a ball, which was very unlike her. Are you okay? You must be hungry. Leo felt terrible. He loved animals, and he put Betty through quite an adventure. The poor thing could barely keep her eyes open. I'm sending you back to the roof for now, Leo whispered. 
You'll find some food in the pond. He closed the duck elevator and pushed the button for the roof. Where have you been? Everyone's looking for you. Remy had woken and tipped over, tiptoed over in the dim light of the lobby, scaring Leo half to death. Don't sneak up on me like that. Sorry, it's a habit of mine. I like to sneak. Remy's mop of dark hair was messy from sleep, and he'd loosened his kid-sized bow tie. Sneaking might come in handy, said Leo. Just don't sneak up on me. Remy smiled widely and stole a look back into the main lobby. I'm going to leave in a minute, he said, but I'll be back in the morning. Can I keep the two-way radio? Of course you can, said Leo. You are my partner after all, right? Remy was growing on Leo, but more importantly, Leo was going to need his help in order to find all the boxes and get to the bottom of what was going on. I could sneak away from the door if you want, Remy offered. How? asked Leo, assuming Ms. Sparks' evil eye was on the door all day long. Ms. Sparks has errands tomorrow afternoon, so my mom will work at the front desk. She said she'd watch the door so I could explore if I wanted to, as long as I didn't go looking for cupcakes. Are there cupcakes up there? Remy looked up at the ceiling, curiously licking his lips. You've never been upstairs? asked Leo. He had such free reign of the hotel, it hadn't occurred to him that others might not share the same privilege. <laughs> Are you kidding? I've only been here one day, and I spend every waking moment standing at that dull front door. It's torture. Remy looked up at the ceiling again. How many cupcakes are up there? Forget about the cupcakes, Remy. We've got more important things to think about. Right now, I have to get these boxes to the basement and avoid Miss Sparks. Boxes? asked Remy, for he had only seen the purple box. Leo cringed. He'd spilled the beans. You found another box? That's awesome! Remy glanced around the lobby, searching for the hidden boxes. They must be important, right? The first one's got Merganser's head on it and everything. Wait a second. He said the purple box had duck food in it. Well, I barely knew you way back then, said Leo. I had to come up with something. For all I knew, you were working for Ms. Sparks. Are you kidding? She won't even give me a bathroom break. But Remy wasn't hurt. He understood that it took at least six or seven hours to cultivate a trusting friendship. So what's in the boxes? He asked. Before Leo could answer, a voice splashed with a rich Spanish accent filled the lobby. Remilio! Time to go, sweetie. Oh, Mom, please don't call me that. It's embarrassing. Leo? Pilar said, finding them at the duck elevator. You'd better head for the basement before Miss Sparks finds you. She needs some cooling off time. Leo couldn't help thinking Remy's mom was about to see the two boxes tucked beneath the rabbit bush, but it was Remy who spied them. Leo could see it in his round saucer eyes. And you, little hombre, said Pilar, putting an arm around her son. We better get you home. You have a long day at the door tomorrow. Remy groaned in agony at the thought of standing in the lobby with Miss Sparks all day but he brightened when he remembered what his mom had told him. I'll show him around the place tomorrow afternoon, said Leo, reading Remy's thoughts. I know the whippet inside and out. Pilar was happy to see her son had made a friend in Leo whom she'd always adored, and Leo liked her too. She'd covered for him with Miss Sparks lots of times. Skip the cake room, okay? She said playfully, messing Remy's hair. You got it, said Leo. You guys can team up all you want, Remy smiled. But if there's a cake room in this place, I'll find it. Remy left with his mom and Leo grabbed the boxes heading for the basement. When he came to the bottom step and creaked the door open slowly, he peeked inside, hoping not to see his dad drinking iced tea and reading the New York Times, old copies of which stood in three towering piles next to his bed. Dad, you in there? Leo whispered. The basement wasn't huge, but it was very cluttered. Pipes, boxes, the call center, the boiler, the washer, the clothesline, and a lot more. No one answered, so Leo crept inside, took the boxes apart, and hid them under his cot, sighing with relief. At least the boxes were safely hidden, even if he was in trouble for going missing for several hours. Leo heard the sound of the toilet flushing in the small bathroom off in the corner and realized he wasn't alone after all. 
He had a few seconds, though, which was just enough time to leave something on his dad's pillow. I thought I heard you come in, Leah's dad said. It was true Clarence Fillmore was a big guy, but he was more of a teddy bear than a growler. He didn't have it in him to scold Leo for disappearing. You know, he said as he sat down, you're getting older now. If you need time to yourself, it's okay. Just let me know where you are so I don't worry that you've fallen down the elevator shaft. Sorry, Dad, said Leo. It won't happen again. And I got the ducks back to the roof for you. You know how Miss Sparks gets if we leave them on the grounds too long. Thanks, Dad. Even at his young age, Leo knew his dad was a little bit broken, a little bit sad. There were reasons for this that Leo didn't like to think about, but one thing he knew for sure. He wouldn't lie to his dad because he loved him too much. There would be no elaborate yarn about where he'd been that his father would probably believe. Good luck avoiding the wrath of Ms. Sparks, though, Mr. Fillmore said. I can't save you from that. Leo held his breath, waiting for his dad to see, wondering if he'd done the right thing. What's this? The big man said, seeing the ring on his pillow and picking it up. The moment he did, Leo knew he'd made the right choice. I found it for you, said Leo, which was true. Leo's dad didn't say anything. He stared at the ring as he lolled it over and lay down on the sinking cot, moving it in the light. I don't know how you did it, but thank you. They looked at each other then, smiling in a bittersweet sort of way. The ring had been missing a long time, but it was back now. It had belonged to Leo's mother. Leo got up before light the next morning and went straight to the roof. He was too nervous to look inside the blue box with his dad snoring so nearby, but he knew by mid-morning the basement would be empty and he could safely investigate. Leo brought the ducks down and walked them through the lobby all in a perfect line out the door and onto the vast grounds. It was a short walk, partly because he knew Miss Sparks would soon arrive and he wanted to avoid seeing her, but also because Betty was in a foul mood. You miss Merganser, don't you? Leo asked, but she wouldn't look at him. Leo took the ducks safely back to the roof and returned to the basement, intent on starting his father's coffee brewing. How about we go to the big breakfast this morning, Mr. Fillmore said. I have a feeling we're going to need it. Leo began to protest because it would mean seeing Miss Sparks, but then he reasoned that A, he could not avoid her forever, B, breakfast at the Whippet was hard to resist, and C, it was a good sign that his dad wanted to eat breakfast with everyone. He'd been keeping to himself more and more, staying in the maintenance tunnels, avoiding contact with just about everyone. Breakfast at the Whippet was brought over from the restaurant and served family style in the puzzle room, which was just off the lobby across from the duck elevator. It was the one time when all the guests and staff members were invited to dine together. Often Leo was so busy during the day that he neglected lunch altogether and scarfed down a late dinner, so a big breakfast was a must if he could get it. Leo Fillmore, said Miss Sparks as he stepped foot into the puzzle room. Sit here, next to me. Leo looked at Remy, who was ashen with concern for his friend, but there was nothing either of them could do. Pass the hash browns, said Lillian Pompadour, and Leo sat down. Miss Sparks was silent as Leo loaded his plate with eggs, bacon, and blueberries. She had a half a grapefruit and two vitamins, which struck Leo as one of the saddest things he'd ever seen, given the choices she had. You know, with Mr. Whippet gone, I'm in charge, she, she said, only loud enough for Leo to hear as the guests and the staff talked and laughed. I do know that, yes said Leo, trying to be as contrite as he could, for he knew this would please Miss Sparks. I could hire a new maintenance man. How would that be? Leo looked at Miss Sparks, frightened of what it would mean if they were tossed out on the street. He would never forgive himself if his father got fired from the whippet. Out with the old, in with the new, it has a certain ring to it, doesn't it? Leo knew better than to grovel or make promises. Miss Sparks would not respond to such tactics. He took a bite of bacon, chewing quietly as her voice grew louder so everyone could hear. Mr. Bump is having trouble with the robot again, she declared. I want you up there the moment you finish that disgusting plate of food. Yes, ma'am, 
said Leo. And bring him some breakfast. Leo nodded. Remy, who was in love with robots, piped in. You got robots up there? He ventured, glugging down some milk as he waited for an answer. Yes, said Ms. Sparks, staring at Pilar as she continued. We got robots up there. Not that you'll be seeing them anytime soon. The accusing look seemed to indicate one of two things. Either Ms. Sparks thought Pilar had done a poor job teaching her child English, or she was sending a veiled threat to the maid. Don't let your little urchin out of the lobby while I'm gone or else. Leah looked down the table and saw that everyone but Mr. Bump and Mr. Yancey had shown up. His dad was there wearing the ring on a chain around his neck, which pleased Leo immensely. Ms. Pompadour was holding Heine, feeding him bits of sausage and yammering with Mrs. Yancey, the oil tycoon's wife. The bratty little girl, Jane Yancey, was downing powdered white donuts with frightening efficiency. And Mr. Phipps stood with Captain Rickenbacker, drinking coffee and staring at the puzzle. The puzzle was unusual for its size. There were 800 thousand pieces, which sat in pyramid-shaped piles on the longest table in the hotel, the length of 12 pool tables, to be exact. It's coming along nicely, said Captain Rickenbacker, gazing over the long table. Mr. Phipps didn't quite agree as he stared at the piles of pieces and the slight progress that had taken place in the years he'd been at the hotel, which were many. I would have hoped better I would have hoped for better by now, he said, but the edge does look nice. He'd been the one to complete the edge of the puzzle with Merganser's help about a year before, after which Merganser had whispered a secret to the old gardener. There are 223 ducks pictured in the puzzle and a pond, and I'm in there too. He had slapped Mr. Phipps on the back, nearly knocking the black freckles off his old dark face and added, that should get you moving in the right direction. Mr. Phipps loved Merganser, but he had no illusions about the puzzle. Clue or no clue, the puzzle would never be finished. It was just too big, too hard. Ducks, you say? Said Captain Rickenbacker, for Mr. Phipps had let slip the secret. Ducks. Does this look like a duck? Asked the captain, holding up a single yellow piece. Mr. Phipps said that he thought it did and then walked to the other end of the table, leaving Captain Rickenbacker to hunt for pieces on his own. Why they waste their time on that ridiculous thing, I have no idea, said Miss Sparks, looking at the two men in disbelief. It's a Zen thing, said Clarence Fillmore, like meditation or a rock garden. What on earth are you babbling about? said Miss Sparks, who had no patience for mystical talk of any kind. She leaned over the table and turned her head to stare at Leo's father, her tall beehive hairdo precariously close to touching a pile of pancakes. I don't think finishing the puzzle is the idea, said Mr. Fillmore. Miss Sparks was clearly unimpressed. I have a mind to take Pilar's vacuum to the whole mess and use the table for firewood. The attention was off of Leo, so he bolted from his chair, gathered a plate of baked goods for Mr. Bump as he gave Remy a look that said, keep your radio on, I'll be calling you. All Remy could think about was standing at the maddening dull door all morning, thinking about robots and cupcakes. Afternoon couldn't come soon enough. Are you alone? The voice came from behind the door to Theodore Bump's room on the fourth floor. I am, said Leo. Hand me my breakfast, Mr. Bump said, his arm sliding out from the cracked open door. Leo put the plate in his hand. The door swung open a bit more, and then the plate and the arm were gone. A moment later, the door flew open, and Theodore Bump grabbed Leo by the ar arm, hauling him inside and slamming the door shut behind them. Can't be too careful, wouldn't you agree? He asked Leo. I agree, said Leo. He had come to learn that more often than not in the Whippet Hotel, short and agreeable answers were safest. The room was fabulous. There were no two ways about it. If it weren't for its eccentric guest, Theodore Bump, Leo would have liked to have spent more time here. He was a kid, after all, and all kids love robots. 
Theodore Bump went to his desk and sat down, typing something out on a computer as he munched on a muffin. A familiar banging sound was coming from a room in the back, but Leo ignored it for the moment. I'm right in the middle of this, you understand. You'll have to deal with the problem yourself. Okay, said Leo. He couldn't know if the rumors were true. No one knew. According to his father, Anne Pilar, who cleaned the room now and then, Mr. Bump was a writer. That part wasn't so unusual. It was what he wrote and how much that made the rumors swirl. It was said that Theodore Bump wrote three novels a month under a total of nine assumed names. It was said that Theodore Bump, it was said that Theodore Bump wrote three novels a month under a total of nine assumed names. Pilar went so far as to say they weren't just any novels under any old names, but famous novels and famous names. To hear it from her, Mr. Bump had written about half of the most popular books around. Leo watched Mr. Bump type at lightning speed for a moment more. Then the man turned in his threadbare blue robe and stared at the boy, his gray hair matted on one side as if he'd gotten out of bed and gone straight to the keyboard. I don't like to be watched while I work. Do you mind? He asked. Oh, of course not, said Leo. When Theodore Bump turned back to the screen, Leo leaned in close behind him and tried to see what the man was writing. He thought he saw a wildly famous writer's name, but he couldn't be sure. He left Theodore Bump and followed the banging sound to the other end of the room. The place was completely overrun with robots. Some of the robots were small and sat in clusters on tables and shelves. Others were two or three feet tall and stood on the floor with nothing whatsoever to do. Mr. Bump had turned them all off because they made too much noise. There were the bigger robots, some of them larger than Leo, and most of them with minds of their own. One made the bed, another one vacuumed, another dusted, all the other robots, and one dispensed snacks. These Mr. Bump allowed to work so long as they didn't bother him. Merganser had programmed them all himself, and he personally kept them in tip-top shape, visiting the robot room just about every day to check on them before he'd vanished. Leo passed by a large padded room where the really big robots were kept. There were three, Clink, Clank, and Clunk, and all were over 10 feet tall. He was tempted to turn them on, turn them on and watch them fight one another, which was highly entertaining, but it made an awful racket, and Theodore Bump would surely report Leo to Miss Sparks. Still. How could he see them standing there, heads bowed, silently staring at the floor without turning them on? He promised himself he would return someday soon when Mr. Bump was out for a walk and watch the robots rumble. Maybe he'd even bring Remy. In Merganser's absence, there was one particular robot that was causing Mr. Bump a lot of problems. His name was Blop. Blop's job was keeping company and making conversation which meant he was programmed to talk with guests in the room and make them feel at home. Unfortunately for Blop, Theodore Bump was never in the mood for conversation. In fact, Theodore Bump was so antisocial that it had begun frying Blop's circuitry. The more Theodore didn't talk to Blop, the more Blop felt he needed to talk. Sometimes he would go on and on and on about things no one wanted to talk about. He'd gone from being an interesting companion to an annoying chatterbox. Leo arrived at the door to the bathroom, the loud noise echoing inside. He opened the door and there was Blop standing in the bathtub, banging his head over and over again on the porcelain. Blop was a small robot, about the size of a mug of hot chocolate. He was mostly silver with large green eyes, and his metal mouth looked like it was made to eat nickels and quarters. When Blop saw that Leo had come into the bathroom, he rolled back and forth enthusiastically on his wheels. Mr. Bump, is that you? No, it's me, Leo. Leo knelt down and laid his arms along the tub, setting his chin down on his hands as he stared at Blop. One thing was clear to Leo as he looked at the shiny silver robot in the tub. Mr. Bump wasn't a violent man, for if he were, he would have picked Blop up and dropped him out the window long ago. Oh, Blop, said Leo, you really must stop bothering Mr. Bump. You know how it upsets him. Very good to see you, sir, said Blop in his tinny, tiny voice. 
You're looking excellent as usual. Tip top. The problem with Blob, besides the fact that he really would not stop talking, was that he was a sneaky little robot. Will you get me out of the tub? He requested. There's work to be done. You know he won't talk to you, said Leo. It was like trying to reason with an unreasonable child. He knew, but he had to try. He'll come around, said Blop. I'm going to try Shakespeare. I could leave you in there and let your batteries run dry, Leo pointed out. Oh, you don't want to do that. My alarm will go off. Merganser had rigged Blop with a terrible alarm that would sound throughout the entire building if he got within 5% of a dead battery. It had only happened once, and Miss Sparks had nearly lost her marble, screaming at everyone for days after. Even Merganser said it was something to be avoided at all costs. Besides, said Blop, I'm solar powered, as you know, and efficient. You'd have to leave me here in the tub for three days, two hours, 12 minutes, and nine seconds in order to hear the alarm. Blop started carrying on about solar power and alternative energy and how he and Merganser had talked at length about putting wind turbines on the roof, but that he worried for the ducks and on and on until Leo thought he might leave Blop where he was and shut the door. Instead, Leo picked him up and placed him in his tool bag. Might I see Mr. Bump now? asked Blop. I'd really like to begin with the sonnets, which I believe he'll really enjoy. Leo knew better than to engage Blop in conversation if he didn't need to. He kept walking until he reached the front door. I'll take him for a walk, he said to Mr. Bump. Don't bring him back till you hit Friday at least. Anything less would be a disappointment. Theodore Bump didn't look up from his computer as he kept typing with one hand and held out the empty breakfast plate to Leo with the other. Once in the hallway, Leo let Blop talk all he wanted. He would take all day to run him out of words, which was what Mr. Bump had referred to. Blop preferred to say 10,000 words a day. After that, he calmed down considerably. He would roll off into a corner and mumble quietly to himself, as if he were having robot dreams and talking softly in his sleep. Friday was three days away, so Leo would have to keep Blop talking for at least 30,000 words. He had an idea about how he could accomplish the task without having to carry the little robot around all day, and he was thinking about just that when his walkie-talkie came to life. Leo, get to the basement pronto. It was his dad who rarely sounded frantic about much of anything lately. I see you have a Phillips screwdriver in your bag, said Blop, who had burrowed his way inside the satchel. And then he carried on about the origins of a great many tools as Leo ran down the maintenance stairs to the basement.